Well, since Yoshi's on a month-long siesta overseas, uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our next keynote speaker, an individual who is kind-hearted, dedicated, um, and dedicated to the field of geotechnical engineering over the last 30 years. He has made an impact to many communities uh, and individuals throughout Western Canada. In the face of the most formidable forces, our speaker has applied his expertise and assiduously led a team of people, emergency responders, Canadian Armed Forces, local government representatives, engineers, contractors, and the public at large to close the Sumas Dyke breach that occurred in November 2021 and devastated the communities of Abbotsford and Chilliwack. Our keynote speaker remains a paragon of humility, letting his practical solutions speak louder than his own accomplishments. His insights will not only enhance our ability to predict and mitigate the devastating effects of flooding, but will instill in us a profound sense of responsibility to safeguard our environment and the well-being of our fellow citizens. It is not just his experience and expertise that distinguishes our speaker. His commitment to knowledge sharing, mentoring, and simply doing the right thing has fostered a culture of collaboration and innovation within the geotechnical engineering community. So I look forward to hearing his thoughts and his experiences as he shares some of his wisdom and a, on a topic that carries significant implications um, for the safety and sustainability of our communities. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Brian L.J. Milaville, or as we like to call him at Contour, the Warden. Uh, yeah, so to, uh, it's just like the red button there. And so, uh, red button here. And then slide. And, yeah. okay. Anyway. Can everybody hear me okay? Everybody hear me okay? Anyways, um, today I'll speak on the repair of the Sumas River uh, dike breach case history. I'd like to acknowledge the co-contributors on this piece of work in this presentation, uh, being Mr. Brian Wilson of Keller, who's in the audience today, and Colin Christensen of Kerwood Lydell. Today's talk will focus on a number of things. First of all, uh, sorry about that, um, site location and description, the breach itself, how did we close it initially? The exploration that was done following the initial closure to quantify the mass. Options for seepage mitigation that we looked at. Design of a barrier. Construction of the barrier. We did a final review of the breach and a fish salvage. We'll take, we'll take a quick look in at where it's at today, followed by a, quick discussion on challenges and lessons learned. In the next short movie clip, I'm going to be breaking all the current laws of driving on the highways. I'm actually filming what I'm seeing as I'm driving down Highway 1. I'm driving westbound from Chilliwack to Abbotsford in the eastbound lane and the only lane that's open to traffic. And I'm literally, when you see this footage, I'm about a half a kilometer or so south of the breach, traveling again, westbound in the eastbound lane. So I'm going in through the outdoor. Or sorry, this is the breach first. This is actually film footage that you've seen on global news. Gives you an idea, it was, the, it was the actual farmer that lives adjacent to the breach that took this footage. Gives you an idea of the hydrodynamic forces that I work when they do over top and there's rapid down cutting of the, of the dike structure.
And at that point, they decided to re retreat real quickly. The dike, the dike breach occurred on November 16th, 2021. Extensive flooding of the Sumas Prairie, closure of highway number one from Abbotsford, Chilliwack. And you can see those folks that are familiar with traveling the valley, here is the yellow barn. This is the number three road, highway one interchange, literally days after the flood occurred. Here's a little movie um, clip. Now what you notice here is the uh, water flowing over the highway. The water is about 10 to 12 inches deep. It's a good thing I had a pickup. Good thing I had rubber boots on if I had to get out of the truck. And I'm literally about a half a kilometer south of the breach at that point. You just keep your eye on the fog line in the horizon and always looking, kind of scanning to your right to make sure nothing's getting dislodged and ending, ending up in your vehicle. The, the westbound lanes are completely submerged underwater. You can't see them. Site location, it's a at the base of uh, Sumas Mountain and just north of Highway 1, right here. This is Sumas Mountain, Highway 1. It's a north shoreline of former Sumas Lake. and about four and a half kilometers upstream or southwest of Barrowtown. You also heard of Barrowtown pump station, the pump station they had to work hard and sandbag to protect against uh, it going down. Uh, basically Barrowtown prevents Sumas Lake from reforming. The breach itself has become a feature on Google Earth, at least as of last summer. Surficial geology. Lacustrine silt to clay, underlying by Fraser River sediments of uh, fine sand to clay silt. This is a um, cross section that was taken from the Kirpin Consultants drawings for the last upgrade that was carried out on the Sumas Dyke. And interestingly enough, this section is within uh, probably 10 meters of where the breach occurred, according to the drawings. The 1988 upgrade consisted of adding a fairly extensive granular zone to the land side of the dike. So that was the last upgrade. The breach itself, again, we see the, uh, the extents of it. The farmer who took the footage lives here. After the breach occurred, the extent of flooding was such that all he had was his house, uh, his house and a few buildings and a pinnacle of land and his, to keep his cows high and dry. The rest was all underwater. In this image, the initial repair, the initial closure, closure of the dike is in place. This is the first time I saw the breach from a helicopter. You've got Sumas River on the right, and believe it or not, farmland, Sumas Prairie on the left, with water flowing actively through the breach. <clears throat> the length of the breach was 150 meters. And the scoured depth was in the order of four meters and, and in some locations slightly, slightly deeper than that. By scour, I mean there's a fairly large scour hole, which you'll see later in the presentation. Again, another view of the breach. And for scale, these little black blips are actual uh, local inspectors residents who just wandered down the dike to have a look at what was going on. This image shows the land side of the dike within about 50 meters of the breach. 
it's here to demonstrate just how, how, um, how uh, forceful these hydrodynamic forces are when they overtopped the breach. It literally ripped away the landside slope of the dike. Basically removed all of the 19, effectively removed all of the 1988 upgrades that were done to the dike, near vertical. You can actually see the layering sequence of the original construction, if you look carefully. Here we go back to that cross section I showed you earlier, Crippen Consultants record drawings. It shows that whole zone's been eroded away. Driving along the dike, you quite quite uh, quite a few locations. You would you would see pinnacles of gravel out into the farm fields. Gives you an idea how things were flowing over the dike that you knew was an overtopping failure. Now we have to close the breach. We were dealing with intense rain, flowing water, working underwater. <clears throat> really the only practical way to close that breach was to use larger material. Of course, 600, what I call 600 millimeter minus crushed rock to get out and across. What we effectively wanted to do initially was cut off the flow. It would still leak, but you wouldn't have nearly as much flow as you had when it's open. There's no possibility of using any fine grained soils to try to put a core back in the dike. Otherwise, you create a, create a quagmire and your dump trucks and all your equipment would become part of the dike fill. <clears throat> the narrow width of the dike um, made it challenging for trucks. Initially, you can re realize this dike, there's an open breach, there's only one way in. You're working from one side, there's one way in, you gotta get back out the same way. So effectively what the truck, trucks had to do would drive down the dike and make use of the existing pullouts. Loaded trucks would move down the dike, park in the pullout, and wait for that one truck at the breach to dump his load, turn around in very limited space and get out of there. And as he's leaving, the trucks basically leapfrog their way up to the next um, pullout and make their way to the breach. These truck drivers were nervous. The initial group of truck drivers that was to be hired didn't really want to do the work. Um, Pretty narrow dike, it's about four, meet, four and a half meters across the top. So the approach was to use coarse 600 millimeter minus crushed rock on the outside of the, of the dike and use a finer material in the, in the central part of the dike. Okay, and I'll explain why. But the initial pinnacle of that went across, or I like to call it the, cross, the initial crossing to stop flow was all coarse material. And then as you move into the, in, into the foreground, we're gonna use finer material, seven, 75 millimeter minus crushed rock, crushed product within the central portion of the dike. I stole this from Neil Peters' presentation a few years ago, the Chilliwack Dyke Breach. Who knew it was a spectator sport? Just look at all the people standing on that trying to close that breach. You wouldn't get away with that today. Now back to our story. <clears throat> so as described, um, we then widened the dike using finer three inch minus till we got our, our basically our, our structure back. The initial closure is along here capped with some fine material and then we move with finer material within the central part of the dike. And once we got across and got it a bit wider, it made it much more efficient to get the trucks through. Now they could drive through, drop their load and keep going. All, the, all this material was placed in layers and well compacted. The decision to use a 75 millimeter minus in the central part of the dike was a key to being able to move on and getting a core in the dike later on. You could have easily continued on with coarse material, but at the end of the day, if you'd have reinstated it with coarse material, you might throw your arms up in the air and say, what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna get a core back in there? 
You saw that little effect? That was supposed to be lightning. <laughs> Periods of uh, intense precipitation, raining all the time. It's, you know, it's wet weather, it's fall. The second series of uh, atmospheric rivers uh, threatened, threatened us in terms of the river rising. At one point, we were nearing removing all equipment and trucks off of the site. And then you wonder, like in the, in the news media, you'll see one or two trucks at the breach when, when they, they show the news. And I had friends in the interior that asked, you know, this was supposed to be a big emergency. All you saw is one truck and one, one excavator at the breach. They weren't working very fast. What they didn't see was, you know, over a kilometer of trucks lined up trying to get on the breach, you know. Okay, now we've got this, we're looking at a shot with the uh, closed breach. We've basically got it almost up to grade. We've got coarse material now placed on the land side. So we've got coarse material on water side, land side. And Sumas River is on the other side of the dike and we've got this big pond. It's closed, but it leaks. The only thing missing in this photograph, maybe a guy in a lawn chair with a fishing rod. Again, another shot. So what's next? The next stage was the geotechnical exploration. We needed to find out how deep, how, how deep uh, fill did we actually put in there, extents, underlying soils, and confirm whether or not, and how, what kind of frequency the, there might be larger particles of rock mixed in with the finer stuff in the middle that would present as obstructions to trying to put a barrier in here. Put on 12 test holes using sonic drill, 15 meter depth. Produced a plan and cross section to get an idea of the extent of the breach. Most of the brown there is the actual breach, green and blue being the underlying soils. So we're able to figure out what size of what size of uh, core, what size would we need to reseal this, depth, width. Random pieces of larger material were encountered in the 75 millimeter minus stuff in the center, but you know, it, it's hard as, as much as they tried to keep the center fine material, there is going to be a certain amount of material that gets in, whether it's an initial ramp trying to get down, uh, some pieces that, that roll, roll down from the, from the other, the, the outside. Um, sometimes there's some bigger bits mixed in with the small stuff. So we did hit some, some larger material. Options considered for seepage mitigation. We thought about reconstruction of the dike to try to put a low permeability core in there, but the problem with that is you gotta basically deconstruct everything you built. And you would have to work below water, there'd be coffer dams involved. It was gonna be a super challenge to try to get that reestablished down to uh, the underlying soils and key it in. Next thing we looked at is constructing a low permeability core using deep, deep soil mixing. And a third option we looked at is with steel sheet piles. One of the key considerations in selecting the option we, we did select was to try to minimize deconstruction. Okay, can you imagine there's a lot of material. We're talking 30,000 cubic meters of material went in to close that breach. In the end, cutter soil mixing was selected. This is a shot of a, of a dike that underwent some distress in Germany. Prior to this event, a CSM or cutter soil mixing barrier was installed in that dike. After they underwent this storm event, the only thing that was preventing a catastrophic failure was the actual CSM barrier in, the, in that uh, dike. 
designed the barrier, the overall objective was to have a flexible barrier and low permeability. We targeted a UCS, unconfined compressive strength of one MPA to keep it flexible. Hydraulic conductivity of one times 10 to minus nine meters per second. Thickness of 640 millimeters, which is standard. And we extended the barrier four meters into the underlying soils to tie it to key in. QC testing, QA testing was carried out on UCS, hydraulic conductivity, uh, both by the contractor and the independent third party laboratory. And in addition to this testing, throughout the work, at the end, we would do a visual inspection of the land side slope of the dike to look for obvious leaks once everything was completed. To confirm the benefits of low permeability barrier, we carried out some uh, steady state seepage analysis using slide two, quick shot of the model. We looked at conditions prior, uh, calculated seepage range between five and 20 liters per minute per meter length of the breach, which is felt to be consistent with what we were observing coming through put in the barrier and it dropped by two orders of magnitude. So we were convinced, yeah, this, this is the way to go. Construction of the barrier itself. This is a shop drawing taken from Keller showing the panel layout. Total of 60 CSM panels were installed. Each panel is 2.8 meters long along the alignment of the dike. 640 millimeters wide. They overlap the panels by 100 millimeters on either side. And depths of insulation between five meters, just over five meters to just under 13. However, taking into account, we had to strip down about a meter at the top of the dike to get us enough width for the equipment. There's an image of the CSM on top of the initial dike repair. Rig was an RTG RG27, basically a large pile driving rig with a mast and a rigid Kelly bar to which the uh, cutter head is attached at the bottom. Cutting tool is a, um, a set of uh, counter rotating drums to which there's attached cutting teeth that allow you to mix and uh, cut down to your panel depth while you're mixing in bentonite and Portland cement. This is an image showing the, C the CSM rig on top of the initial dike breach repair with the uh, scour in the background. Another one taken, scours here with Sumas Mountain in the background. In that particular image, there is the CSM rig and also a pre-drill. We're going to I'll explain about the pre-drill. Bentonite and Portland cement slurries are mixed in a batch plant on site and pumped through hoses to the CSM rig. Bentonite grout injected while you're down cutting. Portland cement injected as the cutting tool is slowly withdrawn. The CSM rig has a monitoring system on board, which basically um, records um, application rates of bentonite, Portland cement with time, advance of the tool with time, and also the, the deviation of the Kelly bar from vertical. They produce reports of that data, they're called CSM reports, or in some circles they call them B reports. The image on the left shows the cutting tool just before it is going to go into the ground, into the dike mass. And the photo on the right shows it as, as it's being withdrawn. So you can see it's a bit, it's a nice uh, gooey slurry. 
We have the CSMRB report for panel number 32. Again, we down cut with Bentonite Grout. Portland Cement is added as, as the tool is slowly withdrawn. And you'll see there's a bunch of noise between six and a half and nine meters. That's due to encountering larger pieces of rock obstructions that the machine really has to work hard. You lose teeth, you break teeth. It's, it's, a, it's a real slug to get through that. In this particular case, the time to complete that panel was two hours and 12 minutes. Not really a desirable situation, especially when you get down to the deeper panels to break through some of these larger pieces. So they brought in a pre-auger drill to try to remove some of these obstructions. Initially, holes were, holes were uncased. We tried it, it didn't work. Then they moved to cased holes, which proved to be successful in getting the larger pieces out. This kind of gives you an idea of some of the bits that were giving us problems. These were set aside. So basically what happens is, the pre-auger pulls the stuff out of one casing, they dump it on the ground, they play around with it, remove the, the big bits, and they send it down to the second casing that's already been pre-augered to return that material to the body of the dike. Again, here, this, this is a shot of the auger coming out of the ground, dumping stuff on the ground, on the ground as it comes out. Now we have CSM report for panel number 34, which is two panels over. But this is after pre-augering. Noticeable absence of noise. And that panel went just as deep. Took 54 minutes to complete, so it clearly demonstrated. And all the past subsequent panels were much quicker. Pre-augering proved to be successful in getting the, uh, the obstructions out of the way. We completed the panels much quicker and considerably less damage to the, the equipment. Panels 33 to 43 were pre-augered, and interestingly enough, only took two days to complete those 10 panels. Now we move on to final review of, of the works and a fish salvage. And I forgot to mention that during the initial closure, the initial crossing of the, of the, the breach, the next morning I went to have a look at that initial crossing and just as I'm standing there, this massive swirl happened right beside where I was standing on the land side of the dike. We'll find out why. Somebody was angry. So as part of the performance criteria, we, were, we had to do a, a visual of the land side slope of the dike as they're removing water and at the same time we're doing a fish salvage. So we pump water out of the, the big hole on the land side, throw it back in the Sumas River. It took about a day and a half to get down, and while they're pumping down, they're removing fish. Sturgeon recovered that were trapped in the scour hole. Some of the fish, well, all of the fish that would have been recovered had been in that scour hole for about 14 months. They had, uh, <clears throat> they had basically <laughs> been sucked through the gap and they were left there, okay? There was, uh, I believe, 10 or 11 sturgeon recovered. Two bright coho salmon, believe it or not, lived for a year and a scour hole, or just over a year and a whole bunch of lesser fish that were removed. The sturgeon were up to seven feet long. With the water levels pumped down, but fish salvage still continuing, a visual review is carried out of the breach. And you can see seepage coming in. Basically seepage coming out of the ground. We had some rain prior and we basically just draining groundwater from the surrounding farm field. The head difference at the time of the um, review was three meters between Sumas River and, and the Scour Hole. No point sources of water flow were detected. And as uh, time went on, the seepage that was, a, was 
increased, just decreasing as you went through the day, and we even went back the next day. So continually decreasing. No um, point sources of water flow were detected, so we considered that the, uh, the construction was successful and complete. Let's take a quick look in today. This photo was taken last week. With the farm field being reinstated, where you remember where you had the water hole. This gives you a, um, a kind of a snapshot of the project timeline. The initial closure was about 36 hours to get across that uh, scour to basically effectively cut off that flow. Reinstating the dike, with their initial repair, getting it back to a cross section similar to what was at either end, took about two weeks. Then there was expiration, analysis and design, 24 weeks. Next, we move into pre-qualification and tendering, selection of a bidder, and then CSM construction. Challenges. Weather, heavy precipitation, continued flooding. Many of our roads were flooded. We had very limited access, very few roads to work with. You can imagine the valley's flooded and as far as the eye can, can see, all you see are red, amber, and blue flashing lights. Every intersection that's exposed has got police or authorities or the military questioning your movements and controlling movements. Materials, high demand. Everybody was looking for material, whether it was to fix slopes or washouts or whatever. Fortunately, for the city, our source of material was Jameson Pit on Sumas Mountain. That's not always going to be the case. Delivery, trying to get enough trucks to get all this stuff out there fast enough. Access, that top right photo, I took that one. Again, that was just before I headed westbound on the eastbound lane. Probably, the, I hope it's the only time I ever have to do that. Much of Sumas Prairie's flooded. We had to manage our uh, travel routes. The photograph in the, bot the bottom right there is actually Eldridge Road in Abbotsford. It's right up tight against Sumas River. It was the only access route for the loaded trucks on that given day. And we had to work to basically raise it temporarily, shore up the river just so we could get trucks. We had the military constantly watching to keep the, the, the uh, trucks down to 10 kilometers an hour. Narrow dike is also a challenge. The truck drivers, they, some of them were nervous. <coughs> and of course, the, the major challenge in putting in the core was the, the obstructions, as we discussed. Lessons learned. First of all, a very, an experienced and motivated team was crucial to get that, the initial emergency works and closure completed in a, in a timely and safe manner. Big shout out to Jake's construction of Chilliwack, BC. They really, they really stepped up to the plate. The second one, which I think is the most important in trying to get that thing sealed, was having the foresight to select the right materials to reinstate that initial reconstruction to make sure we were using fine material down the center so we had options to put in some kind of a barrier. We could have easily filled that entire hole with coarse material, but we would have been stuck at the end of the day. In this case, it allowed us to put our CSM barrier in. And finally, pre-drilling with casing proved to be successful in getting rid of the obstructions. And so we got past all the major challenges. And there we have it. Thank you. That's, that's the brief. Questions? Well, we pulled up all the material. We backfilled with the material, the small stuff that was left over. We just picked out the big bits 
put the other stuff back in the hole. Sure. Bernie. Presentation. Um, did you did you look at using a long-range tackle with a slurry trench for the cutoff construction? No, we didn't. No, because we're 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 having to go down about uh, fourteen meters. Possibly, but in this case, we felt we were going to have a, a, a more continuous, a more uh, controllable barrier through the middle. Uh, yeah, so I was just, now you may not be the most appropriate one, and this is more from a discussion point, but have there been risk assessments for the rest of the remainder of the dike in this area and, you know, recovery plans? Is it for past again? That that's a very good question and a question that's been pondered by many, and there are people working on it. I just can't get into the discussions that are going on with this project just because of the uh, um, legalities with the city. They've asked me to, to to keep it focused on geotechnical and just the breach repair. But I, I know exactly where you're going with this. Yeah, <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do we know what was the It, it was overtopping. That's all I can see, and I, I think I mentioned that in the in the first bit. You could see it being scoured away, and you could see it overtopping. But at a certain point, once you get some through some of the surface granulars, and you and you start knocking off the granulars off the back, you're going there's going to be rapid down down cutting into the silts that are the core of the dike. And I think we saw that in the initial video, the rapid down cutting. So that was a low point. Yes, you can assume because water pretty much takes, take, finds its level, okay? And that may very well be to do with the fact that you, um, the old Sumas Lake was there. The three inch minus that you put in after the Courser fill wasn't so limiting to the CSM ring, uh, but you were finding some larger columns were limiting it. Do you know approximately what size of column was um, well, my colleague can probably answer that, but I'm going to say anything bigger than about probably what six to ten inches, Brian. Yeah, I figured. I mean, ten to twelve inches. It depends on the size of the cutter head you've got on. You've got a six forty on and a ten inch. Uh, cause you problems if you've got a hundred cutter head on. You can probably get up there. Yeah. Yes. Not really. We're, account, we're we're relying on it purely as a barrier, but as you saw from another slide, it could help yep. in another overtopping event. Any others? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So before we uh, break for lunch, which is a little bit on the early side, I'd like to invite Andrea Lohit up here to just have a little talk about the GEO Congress, which is happening next year. Well, I, I'm going to find it hard to uh, beat that last talk, um, and I know I'm preventing you from getting to lunch. So we'll make this quick. So if you guys are not aware, GEO Congress will be held in Vancouver next year between February 25th and 28th. So what is GeoCongress? GeoCongress is the American version, essentially, of the Canadian Geotechnical Society's conference. It is put on by the ASCE Geo Institute. It is a conference that generally attracts 1,500 people. That is well over double than what, Geo, like, um, what CGS has. 
We are very lucky in Vancouver to be hosting this event and I mostly want to, even though all the papers are being submitted in their final form now, I want to promote attending this event and getting involved with this event. So mainly just come out, enjoy it, take advantage of this conference going coming to Vancouver and if you want to get involved or find out more, please feel free to talk to me. This is an event where Lectures like the Tertzaghi Lecture, the Peck Lecture, Seed Lecture are given in person. It is an excellent opportunity. Uh, I know I've, there are several people in this room who I saw in LA this past year. So please feel free, come to talk to me. And if you are aware, I am wearing teal stilettos today because Jew Institute likes to feel the teal. So have a great afternoon. And with that, we'll see you all at lunch. So we have a bit longer of a break, we'll reconvene at about one o'clock.